It's the Emissary Podcast, where we interview the founders, CEOs, and entrepreneurs who have a message they believe is going to change the world, where we help them tell the stories that matter. My name is Paul Edwards, and, and great to be back again in the saddle, along with my partner in crime, Jason Todd. Jason, how are you today? I'm great. I'm looking forward to this talk. Yeah, we've got an exciting guest today. Gabe Arnold and I have got introduced a few years ago through a mutual friend. And we found that uh, <clears throat> we, we kept having some very interesting conversations, mainly over social media, occasionally through video conferences and all that sort of thing. And uh, I just know him to be an excellent human being, a man of character and generosity and a deep concern for the people he leads in his organization and uh, just for people in general. And uh, he's got a book uh, that dovetails very nicely with a lot of the topics we discuss on here. So let's, let's bring on the man himself, Gabe Arnold, author of Atomic Words. Welcome to the Emissary Authors Podcast, my friend. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me, Jason and Paul. I appreciate you guys. My pleasure. And uh, it has been a little while since the last time you and I were on a video chat together. And uh, just to kick it off and make things interesting, in the interim between that, you, you had yourself a, a nasty little... Uh, four-wheeler accident during that time i did i'm i'm like nine months eight or nine months from when that happened it was end of may in 2023 i was out riding in the woods by myself at a campground near where my son and i were at and turned the corner hit a huge rut that i couldn't see from around the corner and put my left leg out and snapped every bone in my leg right by my knee so it's been quite the adventure <laughs> How is it now? Are, are, we, are we pretty much back to normal function? Do you still feel it or what's the, what would you say? Yeah, I'm fortunate. I mean, I have full use range, full flexibility, no, no issues, which I'm super grateful for. Uh, I'm still like built, rebuilding some of the strength. It'll probably be like right around the one year mark. I feel like I'll be a hundred percent or more strength wise. Cause it's amazing to me how, and I was really only like hard down in bed for like about two and a half, three weeks. And I lost probably. I don't know, 50% 50, 50 of my strength in my leg, which is wild. Atrophy happens so fast and we're not actively using something. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. But fortunately I'm on the, on the right track there and I couldn't have wished for a better recovery. I had great medical teams, great friends and great support at home as well, of course. And it's like new, but better actually. <laughs> um, I'm glad to hear that the remarkable power of the human body to heal. And uh, of course, a good, surrounded by excellent people who, who facilitate that process very well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I want to connect this idea of atrophy physically, because it happens so quickly as you've experienced and then takes so long to get back. Atrophy in our physical world, I think is very similar to atrophy that can happen in our communication as well. And you wrote the book, Atomic Words cut through the noise and deliver impactful communication. Uh, walk us through atomic words, cutting through the noise and delivering impactful communication and why that is so important for someone to build a strength in. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good question, Jason, because I, I have an interesting journey as a writer, as an author, as, as a leader and entrepreneur, and I didn't, I couldn't read or write till like late in the second grade. And that was a struggle as it was, and I was not very academic, ended up, I was homeschooled, but I ended up dropping out before I was 16 to just work and do my own thing. And I didn't realize until I was probably, I don't know, my early twenties that I had spent most of my life being really ineffective in communication, not being accurate in the words I'm using, not creating intention around what I'm saying. And I had somebody point out to me one time that I was using words that were just limiting everything in my life. And that was a big turning point for me. That, that was probably the beginning in my early twenties long ago. However, it brought some awareness to how I was communicating. And over the years since then, until, I don't know, three years ago, when I started thinking about writing this book, it helped me understand that we spend a significant amount of our lives in situations where we have the opportunity to communicate and most of us don't communicate at all. We're not very effective in how we show up and how we communicate. And for me, that's just continued to stand out more and more. And now it's very easy for me to recognize when I get to partner with a new client or work with somebody and I, I come in and we start getting in meetings with their team or we start uncovering what's going on. 
and pretty quickly you can figure out if a company culture has a culture of intentional communication, or if it's a mishmash of whatever skills or maybe lack of skills and just doing your best, everybody's bringing to the table. And when we have communication that does not make an impact and creates confusion, we actually end up stealing profits off the bottom line faster than we realize. And profits to the bottom line financially, yes, but also like profits and relationships, connection, long-term, long-term value. That's really important to me and to us as a company. And so I started to develop these different communication tools internally for our team, because I would notice that when I hired somebody new, they would come in and they would communicate. They would the way they would learn to communicate in their past job or whatever they were used to. And sometimes I would be like, I don't know what you're saying. Like you sent me a bunch of words, but I have no idea what you're saying. Or you just spent five minutes, um, talking and I still don't know what you need. I have no idea what we were trying to accomplish. And so that <clears throat> kind of led me to one of the first tools that, um, is in the book, um, that I created. And there's a lot more tools in there, but this one is one I share with new clients, with friends, with people all the time. And it's a cool uh, tool called arc it's a R C. And I developed this because most of the time we get into a communication and conversation and people just start dumping out information and we have no way to categorize where that goes or how to act on it. So most people communicate in an ineffective way because they've never thought through or been taught a more effective way. ARC stands for ask, reason, and context. So I can say to you, Jason, I want to ask you, why do you have that lava lamp in the background? The reason is I'm curious about that. I had a lava lamp as a kid. And I would just naturally move into context and now you can answer a really targeted question. And that's like a simple, silly example, because whether or not I understand why you have a lava lamp behind you may not impact our working relationship. However, if I go to Paul and say, Paul, I have a fr I want to ask you if you could help my friend who's thinking about writing a book. The reason is they have a great message to share, but they've never written a book and I know how hard it is and what it took. And then I'll get into all the context and all the reason of my friend wants to write about this and here's the impact they want to make and here's how I'm going to connect you. And because I start with a clear ask that allows the person that you're communicating with to understand where to categorize and put all the information that comes after that, why you're asking it, like all the little details, but the vast majority of conversations we come into start with context. If we can uncover a reason somehow, that's great. Or maybe we'll figure out the ask. And so I always ask, what's the, what's the reverse of arc? It's usually crap because it, you, there's just total confusion at the end of a communication. And then we can spend, whether it's 10 minutes or an hour or even a couple hours in meetings with people or interacting with folks. And we walk away feeling more burned out and more confused than if we are intentional about setting up those containers, that time and that space and that communication to be highly effective. The reason that I bring that up is, is like one of the tools that I, that I like that we use out of the book all the time is when you get into a conversation with a new prospect or client, or when you have cross team meetings, or you're really trying to integrate and serve somebody, we introduce that tool early on with our clients, along with other things that we use internally, because then we can move forward quickly. But it's also easy to recognize in an organization when there's a lot of meaningless meetings, it's because that they don't have the communication skills yet that would be effective. It's funny that how often this theme comes up for me, Gabe, or, and I'm sure it does for you as well. And that is that of all the attributes and abilities and whatever things we have as human beings. Our ability for articulate speech is singular. There's no other creature on the face of the earth that comes close to the degree of sophistication that we have with spoken language. And yet, <laughs> where is the emphasis placed on, and I'm not saying that from one end of, of the world to the other, nobody pays attention to it because obviously guys like us do, mm -hmm. but yet I feel like it's de-emphasized for some reason, maybe you have some context on that. Going back to your earliest experiences, I feel like I was gifted with languages, but I saw so many people in school. And as I went into the adult workforce who couldn't express themselves yeah. and by the same token, right, even though I had this gift with words, I also couldn't, exp I, I could talk and I could write, but that doesn't mean I was understood or my message was heard. In fact, many times I made it cloudy and 
complicated for people. What do you think is like driving all of that? And why do you think we get it upside down and we don't pay attention to that m critical and singularly human characteristic? I love your questions, Paul. Always. <laughs> I think that in my experience, most people don't know how to communicate because nobody's ever modeled it for them. And mm -hmm. communication and language and story are an inherited you know, part of our upbringing society. And it's also genetic at the DNA level, in my opinion, of like how our understanding of what communication is. That's a piece of it. So there's definitely, it's very environmental because the reason that, let's see if I can articulate this accurately. The reason that the rich get richer and that affluent people have more access and they get to make more impact is because of their education, their ability to communicate with multiple different groups of people and communicate in different age demographics and different situations because they have principle-based thinking. And when you have principle-based thinking, it's very easy. It's much easier, maybe not very easy. It's much easier to be able to navigate new situation and be reflective in how you communicate because communication is hundred percent my job. I need to show up and communicate as accurately as possible, be clear in my words, set my intentions, tell you what I want to accomplish, tell you what I'm trying to communicate. And then if you receive that, then I've hopefully done my job, but you still, you can just get up and walk away and leave this conversation, Paul. And then there's no communication going, no matter how skilled I am. Right. Um, but I always take the view of that communication is hundred percent my responsibility. And when we look at it that way, then that ownership piece is huge because if I spent some time this week launching a, a big new initiative for my team and wrote out, I think it's like a 10 page document explaining in detail, step by step where we're going. And it, it's a roadmap and a draft, like it'll change and evolve. But if I didn't take the hours that it took to write that and think through what I actually wanted to achieve, then I would be more like I was when I was an experienced and young and much more ineffective entrepreneur. I would have been operating from the place that everybody can just read my mind mm. and if they didn't get it straight, then I would probably be mad at them. Um, cause I used to behave like that, unfortunately, when in reality, if I sit down to communicate something and hand it off to a team member, a vendor, a friend or whatever, and I don't get the result that I was expecting, then that's on me. I didn't communicate effectively. And yeah. so it's really a mindset first and like a self-awareness and it's taking ownership of what you the goals the intentions the impact you want to make in in the world with those conversations but i think that the reason that for me and probably other people that we struggle to communicate sometimes is that we haven't taken the time to sit and think about what we actually want and what we actually believe and how does our experience and skill sets apply to those things that's one of the things i respect about you paul is because we person like this and like in private chats on Facebook and in long conversations on Facebook and threads, whether or not you and I don't always agree. And it's something I really value about our relationship, because if we disagree, I actually learn more. Sometimes I'll jump in and say, why do you think that? Why do you think that? Or what's going on? If you are thoughtful and methodical and how you have a reason for what you believe and mm -hmm. you don't, and you don't talk about things that you don't know or don't believe because neither do I, like, I don't talk about things I don't know about because that, that would just be noise. Yeah. Uh, so I think it all comes back to like awareness, ownership, really being a leader and owning in, in communication. And I think that we only have the ability to pick up those skills when we have, when we're exposed to that. That's, that's what I would say. Something that stands out for me with what you're talking about is the idea of responsibility. And in my experience, so many people don't begin with the ask because they are consciously or subconsciously delegating responsibility or abdicating responsibility to the other individual. Yeah. When I was growing up in my house, sometimes we'd go out for dinner and my dad is a very well-meaning man and wants my mom to be happy. And my mom is a very well-meaning woman and wants my dad to be happy. And so we'd hit the car. Hey, we've all agreed we're going to have dinner, but we don't even know where we're going to go. And thus would ensue. Where do you want to go for dinner? I don't know. Where do you want to go? I don't know. Where do you want to go? I don't know where you want to go. And pretty soon somebody's frustrated and, and Richard just make a decision. And the reason the ask was so unclear was because, hey, I'd like to make everybody happy. I'd like you to give me some input when 
the ask could be clearer if someone just picked up the responsibility, which I then did later in life to get ourselves out of these situations. Hey, you want to go for dinner? Yeah, great. It's this place or that place. Yeah. Limit the options. I'm okay with any of them to cut to the end goal faster. And I think that's what you're talking about with the ARC acronym. I think it really does revolve in many cases around responsibility. Are you willing to take responsibility for the ask or are you abdicating or delegating that responsibility to the team? Yeah, that's exactly it, Jason. And are you aware if you are communicating that you do not want to make the decision in this situation? Because that's okay to do in some situations, but be clear about the fact that my wife's amazing. Sometimes she'll be like, yeah, I'm thinking about this stuff and then she'll just see my whatever my face is saying. And she'd be like, I'll decide for you. And I'm like, thank you. That's perfect. Yeah. And there's other times where I want to decide, but there, there's signs of the, the team. It's exactly like that. It's like being clear about actually knowing what you want. And that's where I'm spending a lot of time doing work this year is like really getting clear on what do I want? Because we spend a lot of our lives in a place of needing to meet our needs, which is good. And then ideally we get to move out of that at some point in our life, or that's not like an everyday thing of like, just trying to get needs met. And then when we graduate and move and grow a little bit more, figuring out what you want can be more challenging than I think it has been more challenging for me than I realized it would be. Yeah, but yeah, but once you know what you want, then you can actually take ownership for it and you can communicate a lot more transparently and say, here's what I want to achieve. And in a, in, employer employee relationship like there's i have more opportunity to say hey this is what you signed up for and we agreed on this and so we can build off of that a friendship i can say to paul i want to talk about this stuff are you good with that and he'd be like yeah let's talk about it or he can say no i don't want to talk about that and okay but knowing up front and being really clear about your desires definitely goes a long way and to your point too jason it's definitely about efficiency of communication because everybody wants to be understood and so if we create that space and that culture inside of our leadership circles, whether it's our business, our family, and the friendships that we're a part of, when we open up that space and the intention is about, I want to really be clear in my communication, also to create the space for the other person to be really heard and understood, then everybody walks away feeling better. Whereas if we don't improve these communication skills and everybody walks away feeling frustrated because they haven't been heard, and that's one of the worst feelings for a human being is to be not understood. You also talked about per perhaps a connection between affluence and asking. One of the things that stands out for me in my experience is that folks who have seen more realize there are more possibilities. And if you see less in your life, you don't travel outside of your neighborhood, your community, you tend to settle down into this is just the way things are. And there is an old saying that very simply says, everything is negotiable. Mm. Many people would disagree with that. And so I think that some people cut themselves off from the ask with the preconceived notion that somebody's going to say no anyhow, because it's somehow not possible what they're, what they really want. And I find that many people who are, I don't know if it's chicken and egg thing, you can enlighten us based on your experience, folks who are more affluent, who get more because they ask for more, ask for more because they're like, hey, the rules are made up. And why can't I ask? The worst you could say is no. Yeah, I, I agree, Jason. All the rules are made up. And I, we have a joke in my house because I've been saying it for years since I met my wife, I don't know, 12 or 13 or a long time ago. It's many years ago. I always joke, I'm like, it's my world. Everybody else lives in it. And that is a very true statement for every person on the planet. You yep. know, and it just, it's everybody else lives in their world. And so, yeah, there's lack of awareness of what's possible is definitely a big piece of it. And that's affluence comes from experience for sure. I, I like that you touched on that, Jason, because like one of our family's intentions is to be well traveled. And the reason for that is I want my son to understand firsthand as much as possible how the world works. Yeah. Other countries, other continents other businesses, like other geographics. And that's what opens your eyes to the possibility of good and you know, terrible things that happen. Right. And so, yeah, one of the biggest things that I do when I, one of the things I'm grateful for in my life is I have the opportunity to 
help a lot of people and work in nonprofits and mentor and coach people. And like, when I see the opportunity to jump in and help somebody, I have the ability to do that, which I'm super grateful for. <laughs> and one of the first things that I do, if I'm mentoring a young person or even helping a nonprofit or a business owner, that's not really going where I know they want to go or to the level of potential they want is just expose them to other things mm -hmm. and go do things they wouldn't go or like ideally travel somewhere else that they haven't been. And just new experiences stimulate our minds so much and you do get to see what's possible and you do get to understand, which I love that Jason, that's how I think about it, that they're all just made up roles and you should understand why they're there and which ones might get you in trouble and which ones are just a rule that somebody made up, um, which all of them are, which ones are, are less consequential in your situation. And yeah, that I wish that like in our society, at least here in the United States and, and generally like in societies around the world, I wish that human nature didn't naturally segment us all. And in some cases, I wish that was the case because I like that I have the ability to choose to be around the people that will inspire and help me grow. But what I don't like is we end up having these pockets in urban areas and rural areas and whatever, where there's less exposure to the other groups of people. I wish everybody in rural Geauga County where I live could live in New York city for a year and vice versa, but we self-select for where we are, but exposure to other groups of people and other ways of thinking is really what makes life rich and helps us grow and learn. But ne normal human behavior kind of prevents that because we also want to be comfortable and stay in the familiar and that's an easier choice for most people. <laughs> yeah. I was, <clears throat> I don't want to detract from that, but I want to circle back to something here. Because the process that you're describing there, Gabe, that makes communication simple, it simplifies it so that people can make a decision based in response to what you're saying. Jason, what that took me back to was when we were talking about, it's hard to figure out what you're after until you figure out everything you're not after or everything you don't want, right? And everything you don't yeah. need. And I think. I think it's so important if we're going to talk about the power of words and we're going to talk about getting to getting through to people, I guess you would say, or at least getting our message across, uh, how they receive it is entirely up to them. I think there's a strong element there of figuring out, you know, what do we want to say and what don't we want to say? What do we want to be understood and how can we go, what are the how far can we go in order to make that understood? So Gabe, you've got this, this amazing company that I've had the privilege of learning a little bit about called business marketing engine. You've got this amazing team. You've built this culture that is uh, vibrant and, and people deeply appreciate it. And you get these wonderful gestures of appreciation all the time. Talk a little bit about that. And of course, whatever's, whatever you can discuss publicly, but, um, talk a little bit about how you've. I get the feeling that's been a part of your process there, communicating with your team, communicating with customers, you know, with, uh, and, and with audiences, what do you, how, how do you factor that in? How do you filter out? This is everything we don't want to say, can't stand to say, not saying to get to the, to get to the gold. Yeah, that's an evolving journey for me. Always the origin of where I would say our company culture is at today is probably almost 10 years ago now, I, to back up a little more every year, I typically just set one intention, one goal for the year. So I figure if I can accomplish one meaningful thing for the year, then I'll be fine. I don't need to stack up all these things that I'm going to pretend to do that I'm not going to get to. And so I remember it's almost 10 years ago. Now there was, they were like back to back years. And I don't remember which one was first, but one of the years I said, I'm really not a very strong manager. And if I want to grow this team, I need to become a good manager. And then throughout since I was a teenager, I've always had a, a desire and intention and, and joy in focusing in leadership skills. And that year when I said, okay, I'm going to become a better manager. I realized that I wasn't really connecting for that. I realized I wasn't really connecting with my team. I was just get handing them tasks and saying, here's what I want done. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's one of the more shallow ways to try and accomplish something. And you will typically get a shallow result, right? Yeah. Even if I'm using a clear arc, honestly, which I wasn't even using tools like that for that. If I'm just really focusing transactionally of here's what needs to be accomplished, here's what I want, then there's 
we're missing out on all the richness of connection and love and relationship and stated why and implicit and understand uh, uh, and more like intuitively understood whys behind why we do things. Mm -hmm. And so out of that intention, like I want to become a better manager, I started checking in with a smaller team back then because I was managing them. I don't have to do this much of that anymore, but checking in every morning, like, how's your day going? Like, how's your family? Like, where are you at before we get into the, the work and what's going on? And it helped me just tune in and really understand where my team was at, what they needed from me. And I created that safety and that space where with me being intentional, opening up that type of conversation, then they felt better about asking questions or asking for support. And. Over that year and into the next year, I felt, oh, like I'm managing more effectively because I actually know my people. Like I know yeah. them in a relationship with them. And that was the origin of probably the origin of where our culture as it stands today started. And then probably four to five years ago, I would say now, I was encouraged by a friend, which is really good advice to write down like our core values and guiding principles as a company. It was a hard exercise for me to do because I've never done that before. But after going through it, what I realized is that I was just externalizing and writing down on paper what I believe and how I make decisions. Mm -hmm. And so by doing that, I think we started with 10 or 12 many principles. I think we have 17 or 18 now or something. I, I add some on occasion once or twice a year or every couple of years. Now we bring up our guiding principles. Like our first one is relationships first that we show up and listen. And we believe that our relationships with others are more important than money. And so we're going to show up and serve at the highest level is what the first one says. We have another one that says we believe in positive confrontation, which is talking about how we're going to behave and how we're going to communicate. If like I do this to Paul, cause we're good friends. Like I positively confront him with stuff and say, I don't believe that. Why do you believe that? Like I want to know. <laughs> and that's more of a, a fun situation, but in the workplace, whether it's with a team member that I'm serving or helping or a client, I had a call with a client a couple weeks ago and I said, just so you know, until you increase your pricing, your marketing is not going to work. Mm -hmm. and, I said, and I said, here's why, because you're in the words that you're saying and like how you're trying to show up with part of your efforts, you're saying that you're this premium miraculous service, which you are like, you have hundreds of testimonials. And then when somebody goes to your pricing page, they're like, I don't want a crappy used old beat up Ford. I thought you were selling me a Lexus. Right. Yeah. And price literally just the price is communicating the wrong thing. So I was able to share that and possibly confront a client and give them the opportunity to change that belief if they want to. So those are just a couple examples of organic principles, but we talk about organic principles every week. They pop up every time a team member logs in. And when I log into our Google workspace accounts, it pops up and it reminds me like we're about teamwork communication and all these things. And so by externalizing what I believe and how I make decisions. Amazing things happen uh, when you do that because everybody has the same standard to work off of and they're principle based. So I'm not dictating to the detail behave decisions like the detail level decisions, but I'm saying this is how we think about things and this is the principles we use to make decisions and this is how we treat people mm -hmm. internally, externally, and this is how we think about the company. And that eliminated probably 80% of the questions that I used to get every day from the team. Yeah. And so by communicating clearly, being crystal clear about here's what we think principles, how we're going to behave. Now nobody has to wonder on the team and, and they'll still clarify things or high level things we still have conversations, of course, but all the little things, they have a operating system with which to get yeah. decisions. So that's been without question because we not only did the exercise, cause I think sometimes we do exercise and then we put it away or we tag it up on the wall and it's so oh, cool. There's our mission or organic principles and nobody could say it to you cause they've never looked at it. But we did the exercise and we have a process every week where we bring up one of those guiding principles and talk about them. So they, mm -hmm. they're actually a part of our culture. Doing that has been probably one of the most valuable and highest level activities or choices I've made in the last 10 years. Just yeah. simply putting out our guiding principles and reminding everybody that here's how we live by them and reminding myself too, just because I externalize my beliefs and what I want to do. Doesn't mean I'm always going to feel like showing that up or I make mistakes, but then the team can hold me accountable too, which is awesome. And it, it gives them a degree of input on it as well, doesn't it? Because when, <clears throat> what I found doing a similar thing just intuitively with my team was that number one, I told them all the time, they would say, 
we have these meetings, but we hardly ever talk about the work. And I said, yeah, because if I take care of your soul, the work takes care of itself. Yeah. So we would spend, we'd have a 60 minute team meeting and we'd spend 55 minutes doing wins, challenges, and what you're looking forward to. And we masterminded over each other's lives. And from that, several of the, the young guys built relationships with each other and started becoming each other's accountability partners. And it was remarkable. But the whole time <clears throat> I kept working towards trying to articulate a vision and, and values and, and that kind of thing. And I would present it to them and I'd say, what do you guys think? Do you think this is accurate? Do you think this is, you think I'm the old man's off his rocker? <laughs> yeah. And they were all 15, 20 years younger than me. And so they had only as much experience as someone that age would have. But the point, the fact that a leader who, you know, when we were all that age, leaders just knew everything and they didn't consult peons like us. Yeah. The fact that a leader was consulting the, the, the people who were just working in the organization was like, why does this guy care what I think? And I got some of the same kind of feedback that I, that you've shared from your team in the past. And the reason is I've believed for a long time in harnessing the power of the people around me. So when you're, when you're talking about <laughs> circling back to the question that I put out there, what about eliminating what you don't want? Yeah. Um, I think that's a team effort too. I think it's, I think it actually, Jason and I have done a lot of that with our brand and there's stuff along the way that I'm like, I'm not even aware that I don't want it, but now that you mention it, I, yeah, I definitely don't want that. Yeah. That that's a really good, I use that approach for things too, where I'm confused about what I want. It's definitely good to at least eliminate the things you're aware of that you don't want. And that's, I would agree. That's definitely a, a great way to think through those things. And the other thing I'll say too, is like when you make the choice and the intention to shift and being intentional with kind of com uh, communication and how you're going to show up that way, it's probably going to take you time to rehabilitate yourself out of whatever ineffective or even like lazy communication. I know I was lazy in how I communicated. And now that I've walked through that, and now that we have the culture that we do in our company, I always remind my new hires, I'm like, you're in rehab. And I tell them that because they're usually scared to make decisions. Mm -hmm. Um, scared to speak up, even if they do, they're still nervous, which is all normal because they've been treated poorly and haven't been communicated well with and haven't been led before. So I, I, just, I just, I always tell them, just we're very different here. Yeah. We want to hear from you and I want to hear feedback just because I'm founder of the company doesn't, I, I'm not perfect. I, I probably have the most holes and problems. So I want to hear from you, even if you're brand new here, if you have a suggestion or idea, I'd like to hear that because one, you're either going to point out something that I can approve on, which I want to be thrilled about. Or you're going to ask or point something out and I'm going to say, I'm glad you asked that because you're thinking it's for this, but in fact, this is the reason behind it. This is the why. So I'm really glad you asked because now you understand, because otherwise there would have been an assumption on my side that you understood and you yep. probably would have been assuming on your side that I just made that up to annoy people. But in fact, it has this reason behind it or whatever it is. So yeah, I like that so just to say, reflect what you're saying, Paul, I like the idea of being able to say, here's what I don't want, because sometimes that's even more clarifying when we're not we don't know what we want or we think we want something. And so it's always good to do the opposite like that and say, at least I can figure out what I don't want. Yeah, for sure. As we're winding down in our time for this episode of the podcast, I want to touch on or get your input on how the book integrates with your organization and your company that you're running, because so many authors don't think through how a book fits in the ecosystem of all the other things that they're doing. How have you thought that through? Where does the book fit? Yeah, well, when I was first writing, I, I definitely probably typical authors just think, oh, I want to get this out there and share this with my network and clients and friends. And, and I just want to encapsulate the things I've been thinking about for a while. After I wrote it, having a marketing company and having a team like I did, they ended up reading it, helping me build out our book funnel and do the promotion. And I realized that it's something that I now have all of our team members read portions of or all if they want to because it puts us on the same page with the same models that we use. There's a lot, there's a lot of other tools and models in the book like that. We're just simple acronyms, simple things to remember. And we have more in the company now that aren't in the book too, because it's, we build new tools all, all the time. But as an example, because of the tools in the book and the tools we have, one of the tools is that we use is called the five minute rule. And I tell people like, 
if you're stuck for more than five minutes, then that means you should be reaching out because you have a whole team of people here that can at least talk you through it, even if they don't know what your expertise is or what you're working on. But most often we'll be like, oh yeah, we have a resource for that. Or I was involved in a project. I'll show you how this works. And so by really codifying how we want to communicate as a team, that's one of the reasons why I'm confident I get world-class work out of the team. We maintain amazing profit margins over the years. We're super healthy as a company. Our, everybody loves getting on calls and doing meetings, especially internally. Everybody loves that. And it's because we really have structure and tension around things. And there's not, there's always still going to be areas to improve in this, but overall, we don't have like really inefficient calls or really inefficient communication, whether it's chat or a live video call or meetings with clients. Everybody knows why they're there, what they're saying, what they're supposed to be doing. And we communicate super clearly with our clients uh, on the whole. Again, it's always something we're growing in and that makes just for a better day. Cause if everybody's heard and understood and doing work, they like to do, it's a pretty good day. Yeah. <laughs> what I'm hearing in this. Jason is the emphasis that with a lot of founders that we seek to work with, usually there is either a, a sales or a legacy or a culture bent for their book. And it really seems, though I'm not excluding the other two categories, it really seems like your book has served you well, especially with regard to culture game. Yeah, it's super helpful internally. And I also share it with clients, a client that we just partnered with a few months ago now. They listen to the audiobook when they were traveling and they're like, man, this is super helpful. And I've already seen them start to implement it. So I love it when the clients read it too, because then we're all on the same page between our organization. So yeah, it's, I like it because it's pretty short, easy to read book. You can also just read the pieces you want, which was my goal. You can just pick up and read what makes sense to you. And out of it, you can save so much time and so much you can avoid a lot of frustration and hurt feelings or if those things do come up which they will then you at least have a path through communicating and most executives that i run into business owners are absolutely just overburdened with decisions because they're not creating the environment for communication that they want or and they may not maybe they need to figure out what they don't want at least but it's easy as the owners or even just leading and managing an anger in your role to have tons of questions coming your way because you haven't externalized those beliefs. You haven't created those frameworks. And by living the book and then writing it, which is, I think the ideal, sometimes I surely run into people that do it the other way, but by living the book out, I can say that it's one of the number one reasons why we are profitable and stable. And I have very predictable processes and outcomes because it, it's helped us definitely form the culture that we have today. And communication is all about that. And it's another thing that as I just spent the, the years learning and refining my own communication skills, figuring out what I'm not good at, getting coaching and mentoring, reading great communicators. I spent a lot of time just studying language and not at the level that you do, Paul, I'm confident. But one of the things that stands out to me that's interesting that I want to point out to people is, unless I'm missing something from the research I've done, the English language is, is really fascinating because it evolves every single year. We add significant numbers of new words to our language every year. Mm -hmm. And it speaks to the fact that in our culture and society and in the American language, which is its own society worldwide, we are open, creative and flexible and we mash things together and we change them and we drop words. And I love that about the English language because it's a living language. Yeah. Whereas sometimes you can look at other languages, which I've been learning to speak or learn about like Chinese as an example, I really admire and love a lot of that culture. And one of the things that I'm personally grateful for just in my life is I'm glad I didn't grow up have being Chinese as my first language because it's a highly structured, restrictive language. Yeah. So yeah. And, when, and we're comparing like very macro level things, but if we compare the Chinese culture and language of how rigid it is and how challenging it is to learn and the nuances of it. And we compare that to the English language where we're flexible and creative and we make up new words and, and we're ever evolving. I think those are a good side-by-side -side comparison of what we want to see in our lives and our company cultures of create a culture where we, we do make up our own words in our company. Like we have actual published words that we made up because they, they fit us and like yeah. we're evolving how we communicate and the frameworks and tools and language that we use. And so I would encourage everybody to definitely just look at your life and say, are you more rigid and stuck in how you speak? Meaning that 
whatever, you, wherever you started, you're just staying there and you're just not evolving very quickly. That's going to impact everything across your life. Relationships first down to how you're going to make money, what your career is going to look like, what personal relationships you have. And so I always try to ask myself, am I being flexible in my language, meaning I'm learning new things and can I speak differently to one audience? or one group of people I'm with so that I can communicate the most effectively with them with the words, stories, analogies I use. And then I will shift my tone and approach and stories and language and words I use in vocabulary for another group because yeah. that will meet them. And so that's where we start to get mastery of language when we have the awareness and the ability to be fluid and flexible and adjust in how we show up and how we communicate. Very well said. I was <laughs> sitting there thinking the whole time of how much more uh, it, it could hardly be coincidence the difference in innovation in technology and medicine and just what's possible yeah. in the United States versus China, which has to be tied to the fact that, that whether your language is restrictive or open, open sourced in that way. So that's what I believe. Yeah. Great observation. Great. Yeah. Uh, great interview. This is, this has been another exciting episode as our time has run out to get Mr. Gabe Arnold on his way, but grateful to have had you here, my friend, and to dive into atomic words and glad to see all the success and deep relational value it's building for you inside your organization, as well as outside. Where should we send people if they want to pick up a copy, Gabe? They can just head over to atomicwords.com and that's where you can get all the Amazon links. There's a bunch of bonuses we give away with the book and there was another version on um, Amazon for a period. I went through cool. publishing. Yep. That's the old version. The new version is the all orange cover. Oh, okay. Uh, and uh, so if you're looking for on Amazon, that's what you should be looking for. I had quite the adventure with my original publisher and went on to just move on to self publishing, but yeah, they can go to atomicwords.com and you could, there's also a contact box there. You can reach out to me. And if anybody has any questions, I'm pretty easy to find on social media and I'd love to connect with anybody that's listening in and thank you both for having me on the show. It's great to see you again at fall and great to connect with you and have our time here together, Jason. Thanks for joining us. Great to, great to have you with us, Gabe. And that's another, that's a wrap for another episode of the Emissary Authors Podcast. We'll see you next time.